Hello and welcome to this week's West Asia Post with me, Radhi Francis. Our weekly show where we bring you stories from the world's most volatile region. Today's episode talks about a mystery meeting that is making headlines across West Asia. Reports suggested that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman secretly. Will they or won't they? This is the question that everybody is asking in West Asia. With the recent US brokered normalization deals between Israel and the Arab countries, all eyes are now on Saudi Arabia. And reports of a secret meeting have raised further doubts. So let's begin with what we know. It all began with Israeli media reports stating that Prime Minister Netanyahu had met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. It claimed that Netanyahu and the head of Israel's Mossad spy agency Yossi Cohen had flown to Saudi Arabia on a private jet. The duo is said to have met Crown Prince Salman in the city of Neom. Several news agencies even claimed that US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was also present at this meeting. However, this wasn't a far-fetched inference given that Pompeo was also present in Neom at the same time. The meeting was even confirmed by a member of Netanyahu's own cabinet. In a radio interview, Education Minister Yuav Galant called it an amazing achievement. But soon after the news echoed around the world, Riyadh denied any such claims. Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan said that no such meeting took place, adding that it was only Pompeo who met the Crown Prince. The US State Department also remained mum on reports of any such meeting. Ultimately, when the Israeli Prime Minister was asked about it, Netanyahu did not seem to confirm any such reports. Are you serious? Friends, throughout my years I have never commented on such things and I don't intend to start doing so now. I can only tell you that really, throughout my years as Prime Minister, I didn't save any effort to strengthen the state of Israel and to expand the circle of peace and thank God we managed to do it with our neighbours, with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Sudan and I hope this circle will always expand. So why is this secret meeting which everyone is denying so important for West Asia? If Netanyahu indeed met with MBS, it will be a historical first for the region. The enmity between the Jewish state and the Arab world has been long. Israel fought multiple wars with its neighbors between 1948 and 1973 and has since engaged in continued conflict with many Arab states. Saudi Arabia's official position for years has been that a settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a precondition for normalizing ties. This is a stance that carries great weight in the Arab world. But over the years, the kingdom's position has seen a shift. After decades of preaching that Israel was the enemy, the Saudis are now pushing new messages about the Jewish state. The Palestinian cause is a just cause, but its advocates are failures, and the Israeli cause is unjust. The country has pursued a bold outreach to Jewish figures, with state media outlets and even television dramas emerging as cheerleaders. Traditionally, the kingdom has moved slowly and with great caution when it comes to changes of policy, always testing each move before committing itself. But a shift in relations has been spearheaded by the maverick Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. While several Arab states have built relations with Israel on the basis of shared animosity towards Iran. There are also many financial advantages to linking with the Israeli economy. Saudi attempts to attract foreign investment to fund its ambitious Vision 2030 economic diversification plan, one that appears to be pushing the kingdom closer to Israel. However, any normalization efforts will not be without a backlash. Any new deal 
with Israel could reignite criticism that regional powers are abandoning the Palestinians. West Asia Bureau, we on. World is one. We will continue to bring you the latest updates from the heart of the conflict. We have a lot more lined up for you in the episode. But first, as usual, let's take a look at what's making headlines across West Asia. A sharp rise in coronavirus infections in the Gaza Strip could overwhelm the vulnerable healthcare system, according to public health advisors. 79 of Gaza's 100 ventilators have already been taken up by COVID-19 patients. According to reports, a Turkish court jailed 337 former pilots and other suspects for life over a failed bid to oust President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. This is one of the biggest cases related to the 2016 coup attempt. According to Iranian state media, Iran swapped jailed British-Australian academic with three unnamed Iranians held abroad. Kylie Moore Gilbert was detained in Iran in 2018 and sentenced to 10 years in prison on espionage charges. New reports indicate that United Arab Emirates has temporarily stopped issuing new visas to citizens of Pakistan, Afghanistan and several mostly Muslim majority countries over security concerns. It is still not clear if there were any exceptions to the ban. West Asia is witnessing major shifts. New alliances are shaping up. Gulf nations are undertaking reforms. And amid all this, India's external affairs minister S. Jai Shankar has kicked off a tour a six-day-long visit to West Asia. India is now looking to expand its relationship with the Gulf, a region that is a key strategic partner for the nation. A six-day tour of West Asia during the pandemic, key visits to Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, with External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar leading India's Gulf outreach. The much-awaited West Asia tour started in Bahrain. Jai Shankar met with his Bahraini counterpart, Abdul Latif bin Rashid Al Zayani. He also met with Prime Minister Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa. The External Affairs Minister also thanked Bahrain for taking special care of the Indian diaspora during the pandemic. S. Jai Shankar also paid a visit to Lord Sri Krishna Temple in Manama. Last year, Prime Minister Modi had launched a redevelopment project for this 200-year-old temple. Project worth almost $4.2 million. Shankar's next visit was to the United Arab Emirates, where he discussed further opportunities to work together with the Gulf Kingdom in a changing world. Meeting with his counterpart Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, Jashankar also took stock of India and UAE's growing ties and cooperation. Both the leaders held discussions on a range of bilateral issues, reviewing their cooperation on trade, investment, infrastructure, energy, food security and defense. The External Affairs Minister's West Asia visit comes at a crucial time. The Gulf nations are going through a reform drive, reforms to wean away from the dependence on oil and develop more sources of economic growth. The pandemic has dealt a blow to most of these nations and their oil-dependent revenues. According to the IMF, the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC countries will lose $270 billion in oil revenues this year. These nations are now making big-ticket investments to open up other sectors of the economy, to generate income. India can play a very crucial role here, offering many investment opportunities to the Gulf. Since taking office, Indian Prime Minister Modi has made strong relations with the Gulf his priority. He has traveled to the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait and Qatar. Strategic countries wielding a lot of power in West Asia. Leveraging its strong relationship, New Delhi can take advantage of the new opportunities. But it is not just financial power that India is focusing on. Gulf's financial power often translates into political influence in West Asia, making them key allies for India. And building a partnership that could emerge as a force in world affairs. Another key reason for India's Gulf outreach is its diaspora in these nations. In Bahrain, the Indian diaspora represents a third of the country's population. 
Meanwhile, more than 3 million Indians live and work in the UAE. That's almost 30% of the country's population. The presence of the huge diaspora is an immediate concern, a reason to protect India's interests in the Gulf. With its regional influence growing with this crucial visit during the pandemic, it has now become clear that India no longer looks at the Gulf as a mere source of oil, but considers them to be key strategic partners. West Asia Bureau, we own. World is one. Just hours after Saudi Arabia finished hosting its virtual G20 summit, Yemen's Houthis attacked an Aramco oil facility in the kingdom. This was reminiscent of the drone attack on the kingdom in 2019 that shook the global oil market. We tell you more in our next report. It will be overheated soon and disconnect from my... Yemen's Houthi rebels hit an oil facility on Monday in the Saudi city of Jeddah in another assault on the kingdom's energy infrastructure. The rebel group said that it had hit a distribution station operated by oil giant Saudi Aramco, adding that they struck the facility with a Quds 2 missile. The attack was later confirmed by Saudi Arabia, which said that it was a big explosion. However, the blaze was extinguished within 40 minutes and no casualties have been reported. Aramco granted foreign media rare access to the Jeddah distribution facility, where damage to the storage tank was visible even a day after the attack. The top rim of the tank looked charred, and debris was visible on the ground. The damaged part is uh, uh, almost two by two meter by two meter hole in the roof of the tank. And that's the only thing we can see so far. Once we assess the situation and make a safe access to the tank, we can see and assess the magnitude of the damage of the tank. The site north of Jeddah has been described as a critical facility. It distributes more than 120,000 barrels of petroleum products per day to Jeddah, Mecca and the Al Baha region. While distribution from the plant was restored within three hours, the damaged tank remained out of action. The latest strike comes just a year after attacks on two other Aramco facilities. The 2019 drone attacks had temporarily knocked out half of the kingdom's crude production. While the attack was in response of the Saudi-led coalition's actions in Yemen, what now worries the kingdom is the accuracy of the strike. The facility is located just southeast of Jeddah's international airport, which handles incoming pilgrims en route to nearby Mecca. In the last few years, Houthi missiles and drones have mostly targeted Saudi's southern provinces along their shared border. But the attack on Jeddah, which lies some 600 kilometers from the frontier, is an indication of the rebels' advancing arsenal. Saudi Arabia has been involved in the Yemen conflict ever since Houthi rebels took control of the capital Sana'a in 2014. A Saudi-led military coalition intervened in 2015 to support the internationally recognized government. The kingdom has since been a target of various missile attacks. However, cross-border attacks by Houthi forces have escalated since late May. Ironically, the attack comes at a time when the Trump administration plans to designate the Houthis as a terrorist organization. A move that could cripple aid delivery in a worsening humanitarian crisis 
and tip Yemen into famine. West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. American B-52s have made their return back to West Asia. These giant veteran aircraft were last deployed in the region in May 2019. Ironically, the deployment came at a time when the U.S. is withdrawing troops from Iraq. So why is the United States bringing back its massive strategic bombers to the region? We take a look. This is the B-52, an American long-range jet-powered strategic bomber, operating in the U.S. Air Force since the 1950s. Last week, two of these bombers flew all the way from North Dakota to West Asia, a distance of over 7,000 miles. They were last deployed in the region in May 2019. So why did these bombers suddenly fly for nearly 24 hours to reach the Persian Gulf? Most reports suggest two main reasons. To deter arch-rival Iran and as a show of strength to its allies in the Gulf. A press release by U.S. Central Command said, and I quote, the short-notice long-range mission was intended to deter aggression and reassure U.S. partners and allies, unquote. While the sudden dispatch is most certainly a show of strength, the bombers flying over Israel and Jordan, two key American allies, is also no mere coincidence. Ironically, their deployment to the region comes at a time when the U.S. appears to be withdrawing forces from Iraq. The shakeup and the deployment of the B-52s now brings changes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Posing questions about the continuing role of the United States in West Asia. While this deployment looks like a largely symbolic gesture, for now, the message that the bombers send remains loud and clear. West Asia Bureau, we are. World is one. The village of Adarbasiya in Syria's Kurdish-held northeast is infamous of breeding racing dogs. However, the once lucrative business was first hit by war and now the pandemic. But the villagers remain undeterred. We take a look. On his motorbike, Mohammed Darbas speeds across a field in northeast Syria with slender Saluki dogs galloping behind. He hopes to export them for racing in the Gulf despite the war and coronavirus pandemic. Salukis have been used for hunting for thousands of years in West Asia. They were revered in ancient Egypt, being kept as royal pets and mummified after death. As cousins of the Greyhound, Salukis are among the fastest of canines. The Syrian village of Ad Darbasya is famous for breeding and exporting them to the Gulf. Most of these dogs go to the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, where desert dog races are popular. But the once lucrative export business was dealt a blow by Syria's conflict since 2011. And this year's coronavirus pandemic has further hampered trade and travel. Before the war, people from the Gulf flocked to the region on a daily basis. They used to hunt in Darbasiya, Kamishli and Damascus, as well as observe and photograph the Saluki dogs. Even though business is slowing, Darbas keeps his hundred dogs in top shape. Tails wagging, they rally around him as soon as he enters the fenced enclosure. Some of the hounds have their ears cropped, while others boast long legs partially dyed orange with henna. 
to improve their speed and endurance, he straddles his motorbike and sets off at full speed with a pack of dogs following him close at his heels. The dogs he breeds can be sold for around $400 to $1,600 depending on their attributes. Saluki dog's value starts from 1 million Syrian pounds and can reach 2 million or 4 million Syrian pounds and this depends on the customer. Darbas used to export between 100 and 150 dogs annually before the conflict. But that figure has now dropped to 20 in recent years. Airport closures have further weakened his trade, especially since the dogs are shipped to the Gulf via Damascus Airport. In the meantime, he hopes to attract customers through social media. His Instagram profile shows pictures of dead rabbits caught by his salukis. Other posts include videos of the dogs sprinting behind a motorcycle. Once a beloved hobby, training dogs has now become a business for many in the area. But many villagers find the idea socially unacceptable. It was not socially acceptable to own a dog. People did not like them, but some of them were obsessed with raising dogs and they loved them. The dog trading business started recently. Some of them were obsessed with raising them and they loved them. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay home and stay safe. I am Ghadi Francis and you are watching We Are World is One.